Well, last and certainly not least to the end of our day speaker today, um, I would like to introduce you to Father Mark Steltzer, if you do not know him, many of you do here. Um, Father Mark is a graduate of Springfield Sacred Heart and Cathedral High Schools. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1983 and has served at the Elms College since 1987. In addition to his responsibilities at Elms College, Father Mark is pastor of St. Mary's Parish in Hamden and co-vicar for clergy. Father Mark holds his licentiate and doctoral degrees in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America. For more than 20 years, Father Mark has offered courses in addiction studies at Elms College. He is a member of the Massachusetts and National Association of Alcohol and Drug Addiction Counselors. Since 2015, Father Mark has served as Director of Education for Guest House, a treatment center specializing in the care of clergy and religious, excuse me, religious living with addictive disorders. Please join me in welcoming Father Mark Steltzer, my friend and former <laughs> professor. Thank you, when people start introducing me and giving the number of years I've been here, I sort of feel like Methuselah, <laughs> sort, of, sort, of, sort of like I came with the bricks at this point. But uh, before we get into the presentation today, I just a couple of introductory remarks uh, before we rush out of here and get busy with the rest of our lives after. And I would like to thank in my own name and in the name of the bishop and Dr. Dumay, the wonderful committee uh, that planned this event. A great sign of collaboration between the diocese and the college. Uh, because of COVID, so many of these programs uh, just could not be a reality. We couldn't gather in space uh, together safely, but uh, with Celeste, our Director of Faith Formation for the Diocese, again, one of my students here, and also Deacon Dave, another one of my students, and when he was speaking about that first semester of diaconate studies, I remember spending a lot of time with his wife, Deb, and him uh, talking about his son. And um, the story was bleak at that point. And we come together today to listen to stories of recovery. So thank you so much. And also a joy always to work with Sister Melinda, uh, who brings so much joy to the Sisters of St. Joseph and to our diocese. And Melinda was also a student of mine here uh, when she did graduate work. And finally, but not last, uh, to my great colleague in religious studies here at the Elms, uh, Dr. Mike McGravy who's been doing a lot of behind the scenes work with the media. Uh, Mike came to the Elms uh, right as COVID broke out. So we hired him and then we really couldn't see him because we were all virtual. So it was like a two year hiatus of knowing each other, but knowing each other only on Zoom or the rare meetings we could be together. And it's been just such a pleasure this past year and a half or so to really work with Mike uh, hands-on on the grounds uh, with programs such as this. Uh, just to briefly qualify, um, I've been in long-term recovery myself uh, from addiction to alcohol one day at a time and certainly with God's grace. Um, I began the journey of recovery uh, back in 1999 uh, when I received treatment at Guest House uh, for which I now work remotely, working with priests and religious, uh, living with the same disease I have. And when I came back from treatment, I came back to teach at the Elms, and uh, because we're so short of priests in the diocese, I've always had another assignment. And that other assignment, which was not really planned, but ended up being providential, uh, was an assignment to Bay State Medical Center as the chaplain. And that, in retrospect, was such a grace period in my life as a newly sober person. Uh, the very first week I was there, I ministered to a man exactly my age. Um, the poor guy even looked like me a little bit. And um, he had tried to detox himself at home and died in our ICU as a result of a seizure. And I was there four months sober the next morning, consoling the wife and the teenage kids. And I saw so many things, especially in the emergency department with some of the clinicians that were here earlier, people like Ida, so many of the nurses, uh, people coming in in trauma, people who have been involved in drunk driving accidents, 
uh, people that were killed as a result of drunk driving, and in one bay of the trauma room would be the person who was killed, and in the next bay would be the person who actually was driving the car that killed them, and dealing with both families. And I've seen, you know, the pain of addiction, and also working in the former Carlson unit, which was at Bay State. It's now still a treatment center not run by Bay State. I worked, spent a lot of my time at Bay State there, seeing people recover one day at a time. So I'm very grateful to Guest House and to the diocese and to the college. And I've taught here for a long time and for 20 years I've taught the course Addiction and Recovery. Um, it's taught every semester. Uh, Chris, one of our, still teaches remotely for us, uh, Chris, Dr. Chris was here, one of our faculty members always uh, sent her nursing students my way and I took a look at the class list over 20 years and uh, at the last count there were approximately 1,800 students in the past 20 years that have graduated from the Elms. Uh, taking a course in addiction and recovery, the subtitle of Spiritual Journey, uh, the very topic of what we're discussing here today. And these young people you saw here today were uh, all my students this semester in that course, which is still running in two sections. Uh, we say it in circles of recovery. Um, meetings like this are the only place where you can say the word sober and alcoholic in the same breath that it's possible to be a sober alcoholic. It sounds like a paradox, huh? But recovery is possible and treatment works and programs like iCatholic work. So before we begin, uh, since Scott, my friend whom I've met through Guest House has come so far, I just want you to see some, a brief clip from his webpage, just to let you know some of the resources that are out there. And then we'll get into the topic of today, talking about adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and how they impact addiction and the hope of recovery. So Scott, from California, by us virtually, huh? Same largely in part because of his colorful past and the transition of sainthood in which he made over the course of his life. St. Augustine, known for his addiction to lust, sexual impurity, debauchery, and his life really centered around very earthly, holy things. His mother, St. Monica, famously prayed for him for 18 years before his conversion. And a man who saw many things of the world found himself unfulfilled. This quote from one of his most known works, titled The Confessions of St. Augustine, says, My heart is restless until it rests in me. I think that really speaks uh, to those of us in recovery, seeking freedom from addiction or other unhealthy passions, whether we're newly sober or have been sober for quite some time. It's that longing, that's something that's missing in our hearts, that, that keeps us restless. Oftentimes, that restlessness leads us to turn into alcohol, drugs, pornography, sex, gambling, compulsive eating, other forms of control or perhaps worldly um, obsession. We can look at the model of St. Augustine who turned his life around and through the intercession of his mother, through the really a new fellowship we found, uh, which turned his life towards God and then allowed him to be known as a doctor of the church. So it had a really big impact in the growth of the development of the church. So much like St. Paul, who was right with Ephraim, and who was very instrumental in turning him and converting him towards Christ. Uh, we can turn to St. Augustine for someone who has known a past that perhaps has some darkness, temptation, and struggle, and, and use that to propel us towards a new, a new freedom, a new joy, a new purpose in life. So the purpose of the day, thank you, Scott. Um, the day, purpose of the day is to talk about joy and to talk about hope. We've talked a lot about a lot of heavy things today. We're going to talk about some things that might be a little bit painful at the beginning of this last session. Uh, but the ultimate goal of this day is to say once again that treatment does work and that recovery is possible. And certainly in our church, in the rich tradition of saints like Augustine and the scriptures, in the sacraments, 
Uh, we find that great hope and that great strength. And this weekend in the Mass, we'll listen to St. Paul, who says, I boast in my weakness, huh? And all of us in recovery say the same thing, that our dark past becomes the greatest gift that we can share with each other one day at a time. So as you listen to those readings today, um, they really speak powerfully. And if you're able to stay for mass today, we're gonna have a little treat instead of me giving the homily. I'll say two sentences on the readings and then Scott's gonna give the reflection. So we'll get to hear him make a connection between the readings and all that we've done here today. So as I mentioned, what we'd like to talk about in this last session are adverse childhood experiences, uh, which are grouped together clinically with trauma, how they impact addiction, the potential for addiction, how they potentiate those genes that Wayne Gabrick spoke about this morning, the addictive gene within us. We're gonna be talking about some things, as I mentioned, that might be painful uh, for people sitting in this room today or people with whom you might share this message or when you get this PowerPoint electronically uh, as you share it with them. Because we're talking about some parts of our past that maybe we have not been invited to look at for a long time or have chosen to sort of dismiss or ignore altogether. So I would encourage those of you who might find this a little bit disturbing to know, as we said earlier, Scott said it so well, the resources for healing are right in this room. Uh, to talk to somebody here, to take our business cards. Card, uh, Scott has a card, I have a card, Melinda has a card that's available to you. Uh, scan these things with your phone and you'll get loads of resources that we didn't want to chop down 10,000 trees to print out. Huh? But there's loads of resources here to sort of help deal with what we might be experiencing. And the last uh, sort of infomercial before I move on is if you'd like to learn more about the dynamics of families and addiction, there's one very short book, seven short chapters, which is entitled Addict in the Family by Beverly Conyers, who lives right in the Worcester area. And it details her family's journey through recovery. I've used that book for the past 15 years with students, and Virginia was one of my students, and she's shaking her head. And it's probably the one book I always ask at the end of the semester, what book do you prefer most, or dislike, how can we improve the course? They constantly say, and Father Mark, bring back that book again. So it's gone through three different editions. The price has only gone up each time. It's the same book, okay? So whatever edition you get, buy it used, new, any edition. It's a wonderful story, especially if some of this is a little bit troubling to you. So we sort of place ourselves in the context where I began about really not being able to do things like this for so many years because of the COVID crisis. And I don't mean to sound like the true professor advertising books, but another book you might want to take a peek at just for your own spiritual and intellectual stimulation is the book by Pope Francis, Let Us Dream. And he wrote it at the height of the pandemic, just reflecting on what was going on in our world and in the hearts of so many people. Because I think if we go around this room, uh, we'd all have to admit that things are different since the pandemic. Huh? I know that I'm different, you know? I find myself sometimes days when I'm just a little bit off since then, you know? I know with my students, they're very different. You know, the freshmen I have, you know, at one point said, you know, we missed all of our sophomore year and half our junior year. So there's real delays socially, huh? Uh, you can see it in people's faces in church, especially when we reopened. People seem to age 10 years to me, a lot of them, huh? It's taken a toll on people. And Pope Francis speaks of COVID as a twofold crisis. Certainly the global crisis of the epidemic, the pandemic itself, but he also speaks of it as an existential crisis, that something has happened in our hearts and that change and that introspection that's taking place and the uncomfortability socially and otherwise. And it's largely, in my opinion, as a result of the twofold crisis, but largely the existential, 
that we've seen the rapid spike in deaths as a result of use of opioids and alcohol, that we've seen a profound increase in the number of people living with mental health disorders or a combination of a substance abuse and mental health disorder. Uh, these numbers have spiked. And again, if you go to the QR code, uh, open up the statistics for Massachusetts and look at your town or look at your city and just look at the increase in opioid-related deaths for the last four years. And you're gonna see the spike. You're gonna see the spike. I don't know if we have people here other than Wayne from Franklin County. It's really noticeable and so sad. The city of Pittsfield, my little town of Hamden, where you think everything is just so nice and copacetic, four opioid deaths in 2021. The stats for 2022 aren't in. All of these things that we sort of know are happening, but when I saw the numbers, I said, there's a real need right here in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, for us to talk about this. And the same stats are there for alcohol-related deaths and the spike in mental health uh, diagnoses. And the very sad part is that for every person diagnosed with a substance use disorder or mental health disorder, there are countless others who are not diagnosed and as a result are not treated. And you'll see those startling statistics there. The people not treated far outweigh the percentage, the number, the percentage of those who actually are fortunate enough to find treatment of some time. And these crises reveal our hearts, as Pope Francis says, you know, so poetically. It gets us to look and to ask those big questions, like what's it all about, Alfie, huh? The old song? Where are we going with this? And is there any light at the end of the tunnel? And I think, I firmly believe, and without being Pollyanna, that days like this begin to shed some of that light that we're desperately looking for. So sort of to go into the trauma and adverse childhood experiences and addictions, just you've heard it several times in several different ways that addiction and recovery operate on many domains, huh? There's the biological and the physical dimension to it, huh? The more people drink or use or even enter into process addictions like gambling or hoarding, there's fundamental changes physically that happen within them, huh? You can see it physically, huh? You can just do a liver profile of somebody active in drinking, huh? And we begin to see them physically deteriorate as a result of the addiction. We know, talking about brain chemistry, uh, Dr. Wayne talked about that a little bit and Scott did too, that there's fundamental changes in neurotransmission that take place uh, between things like dopamine and uh, serotonin and those just neurotransmitters that, you know, that give us the feeling of being well or at peace and living with less anxiety that the more we enter into the addictive process or ingest the substance, fundamental changes take place in neurotransmission which take place in the brain, huh? That's why we speak of addiction not as a choice but it's a brain disease, it's a disease of the brain. Once we've moved from occasional use or perhaps misuse to the state of addiction, uh, we speak of it as a disease of the brain. It's a social disease. I know at the height of my drinking, it was here fellow well met, huh? It was like cheers. I was known in every bar in Chicopee, I know every parishioner's house, you know, the priest that you'd invite, have a great time with, have drinks with. The first pastor I lived with, he'd like to drink more than I did. At that time, we had a lot of priests, and at every gathering of priests, there was always booze, huh? Uh, celebrate confirmation to that 15 priests there, and it you just turned into like a large meal with drinking and all of the things which were safe for some people, but certainly not for me. By the end of my drinking, I was drinking alone, huh? and we're removed from people, places, family, and things. Scott spoke about his relationship with his girlfriend, huh? We lose things. Addiction never gives back. Addiction takes and takes and takes and takes until there's no life in us, huh? We might be living physically until the point we die sometimes as a result of the use, but there's nothing of life left in us, huh? 
You know, we're just, we're just shadows of ourselves. And you saw that in a cartoon. That was great, Scott. I never saw that before. And also, the difference, it's a spiritual disease. We've talked about that. There's this spiritual component that even the brightest brains in psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, like Carl Jung, finally said, I surrender. You know, I can treat all of these psychiatric symptoms as best as they could back then. We can try to get the person stable physically, you know, maybe even socially reintegrated. But there's this spiritual com component to it. And spirituality is not the same as religion, huh? Spirituality deals with things like life meaning, transcendence, connections, purpose, truth, values, huh? These are spiritual principles. And with addiction, these things begin to just fade in our life, huh? You know, for most people active in their addiction, the lie will come quicker than the truth. David sort of said that, huh? Even when we don't need to lie about something, huh? the lie will come quicker than the truth. And that's not necessarily because the person is bad. It's the effect that this has had on the brain, huh? Brain chemistry changes, huh? And the only hope is protracted abstinence from the process or the substance in the hope that that dysregulation of neurotransmission will reverse itself. And very often medication is needed to assist with this, especially in the early stages of recovery to help you know, get that neurotransmission back. Certainly psychotherapy. You know, I worked with a Jewish psychiatrist who had never worked with a priest before when I came home in 1999. So I was like an enigma to him. And he sort of loved it. He was fascinated by me. Now, having a priest who was an alcoholic. And first thing he said to me, I can meet with you at the beginning, like twice a week and then once a month. But he said, if you're drinking when you're not here, he said, I probably won't know because you'll be smart enough not to come in here drunk. But he said, if you're drinking and I'm trying to prescribe you at the beginning, he said, nothing's going to work. Huh? So the only shot you have at getting sober and staying sober is protracted abstinence. Now, this guy wasn't an AA guy, huh? But he was a pretty smart, smart psychiatrist. And I was going to him for years and years and years. And he kept saying, I need to discharge you. And I kept saying, well, I like coming to see you. And then he finally said, well, I'll take the $300. Keep coming. And he developed Alzheimer's. So the relationship had to end, huh? So he's down in Colorado now. He married his high school sweetheart. And uh, he's back down there. And we still talk and all that. But protracted abstinence is the only shot we have. And that's why these support groups be, become so important, because I can't do it on my own, huh? We need other people who've been there before us. And the good news is that, you know, there are marked improvements with recovery in each of these domains. People get better physically, you know. People, depression lifts, anxiety lifts. You know, we're reintegrated socially with family and with friends, and we're able to contribute to society. We do things like pay taxes once again, or pay bills. Uh, you know, talk to an alcoholic or addict active in the addiction. You know, the bills come in, you know, even if you have money in the checkbook, you don't pay them because everything's procrastination, huh? In my active addiction, if I saw a letter from the chancery, I went in the wastebasket, you know? You know, what do they want with me now, you know? That's just how it goes. It affects the way we think, but and spiritually, uh, we're reintegrated. So here's looking at it another way. A common denominator of addiction is pain. Marcel Proust, the French writer of the last century, said, there's a lot of things we can ignore, but to pain we must listen. And addiction, if you talk to anyone here, a lot of my friends here, professional physicians here, nurses, people, counselors who have dealt with people in addiction, we really can't achieve that lasting sobriety and inner peace until we've been able to accompany the person in the journey to what that pain is. And proven experience tells us that that pain is on one or more of these four domains. Very often, it's physical pain, huh? My drinking directly increased. It was, I was very young, relatively young, uh, in 1999, 
and I developed a problem with my hip, which eventually needed to be operated on, huh? So my drinking increased because booze took away that pain, huh? Uh, same thing with opioids. I mean, they weren't quite around as much as certainly not as much illicitly then, but if I had access to them, I'd probably try them out, huh? You know? Or telling yourself certain messages like, well, if I take tramadol, it's a synthetic opioid that the doctor gives me, that's okay. Uh, there's a saying in 12-step recovery that very often with prescribed meds like that, people are simply chewing their booze. <laughs> especially with certain types of drugs you know, for mood disorders, very similar in the chemical structure to alcohol. Uh, so it can be physical pain, it can be social pain, it can be spiritual pain. And so the key to the journey is addressing the pain. And for many people that pain begins with disordered relationships in our life. We are born to be in relationships with each other, huh? That's the very nature of what it is to be human. That's why we're linguistic beings. You know, no person is an island. You know, the great poem. We're meant to be together. So we're born to be, you know, people in relation with each other and just experience and all sorts of therapists and psychoanalysis has told us that the way we are touched as little people becomes the way we touch. The way we are spoken to often becomes the way we speak to others. The way in which we were seen or viewed or understood often becomes the way in which we see and understand ourselves and with our others. You know, if we've grown up with people giving us negative messages about ourselves, we interiorize that and sort of say, if mommy or daddy are saying this or my grandparents or my teachers, then they're the adults, it must be true, huh? So addiction is about disordered relationships, the relationships in which we should naturally be able to find strength and comfort with a parent, with an older sibling, with a teacher, and that relationship is disordered. As we trace the pain that leads to active addiction, we often find it's a result very early in life of disaltered or skewed relationships that manifest themselves as adults and this inability to speak, you know, respectfully to others or to have a proper self-image or view of others. So we speak of trauma, and trauma sounds like a big dramatic word. So in the next slide, I'm going to change it to adverse childhood experiences. It sort of softens it a bit. It's an interruption of those bonds that should be there, the natural bonds. And it alters our ability to enter into relationships that are modulated, relationships with boundaries, where I don't step over people and I don't allow people to step over me. Boundaries can sort of best be explained in this way. A boundary express, expresses the reality of where I end and where you begin. It's not a fence that you can't get through, huh? But it's that imaginary line where I end and you begin, huh? That we are not so enmeshed that we allow one part or the other to walk over another, to treat each other with disrespect. That we're able to say and stand up for ourselves and say things like, if you choose to continue the conversation in this way, in this tone, then the conversation is over, huh? These are things I learned in treatment. To be able to say, no is a complete sentence. Can you do this? Do you want to do this? No. I don't have to give reasons, huh? I don't have to people please. And people living with an addictive disorder, and it was touched upon by Wayne and I think Scott, we very often become codependents, huh? We want the whole world to love us. And I always say this to my nursing students, not to point the finger at anybody, and I know there's nurses in the room here, Cheryl and others, so don't kill me, but the profession with the greatest number of people living with codependency is nursing, okay? <laughs> my profession comes right after it, huh? Religious, you know, especially religious women, orders like that, that, you know, we're sort of quote unquote suckers, huh? Uh, and it comes from just family of origin messages, huh? 
You ask a, a nurse, person who's a nurse, you know, did you ever play nurse as a little kid? Yeah, I was Nancy Nurse in my family, huh? From a very early age, I was the one who always made things better for everybody, you know, who fixed the boo-boos, who had my little nurse's kit, huh? And so we grow up with these messages that I have to be the fixer, huh? That this is the validation of myself. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable here, huh? Because I have to watch myself all the time with that, huh? These things are chronic. They don't go away. Uh, we just get better at managing them. So the usual responses um, to trauma that we experience are these things called adverse childhood experiences. We used to just speak of three. You either stand up and fight for yourself. You're not going to treat me like that. You get in my face. I'm getting back in your face. Or we run from it. Get me out of here. You know, leave home at 16. We freeze, sort of emotionally constricted. You know, we don't even know what we're feeling or thinking. Or the next one we speak about now is fawn. We become the people pleaser, huh? We're like Bambi. Uh, we're going to fix the whole family. And this really isn't as bad as it looks. So these are very normal, understandable, justifiable, but ultimately unhealthy responses to adverse childhood experiences or trauma that we experience later in life. So I, again, I'm not going to play games with you, but if you ask most people five years ago, do you know what aces are? They thought cards, huh? Uh, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences. And here I'm very grateful to the Beacon Group uh, which has done a lot of clinical research on adverse childhood experiences. And again, this can be painful because I don't think anyone here grew up in Leave it to Beaver's home, huh? Where the mother was always dressed in a party dress at 7 o'clock in the morning cooking breakfast, huh? Where the husband always went out the door at 7.05 with the lunchbox, huh? Where the meal was always on the table at 5 sharp. Um, if you lived in that type of family, then you probably don't belong here, huh? <laughs> uh, because I certainly didn't, huh? I certainly didn't. In a lot of families, chaos is the rule, huh? Or some version of it, or certain degrees of it, or certain dysfunctions. So what are some of these experiences? They're, they're very common. You can read the numbers there, which are proportionately very, very high. And we see that some children in certain groups are more vulnerable than others. Women are more vulnerable as little girls or even as young women um, to experiencing adverse childhood experience. And again, certain uh, other groups in society too. And you can look at the reference there at the bottom for more. So it can be abuse of any kind, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. You know, constantly receiving negative message. You're not as smart as your sister. Or you're never going to college. Huh? Or we don't, they don't say it as explicitly, but if only you were as pretty or as handsome as your brother, you know, you might get the boyfriend or the girlfriend you're looking for. You might be the, you know, the queen in the, or whatever it is, the Colleen in the parade and all of that. that. These messages are given. And they can be not just in our family of origin, but at school. Huh? You sort of look at people's school background and as you begin to remember teachers and, you know, I was director of Catholic schools at one point up in Pittsfield and um, when I was down here still they just needed somebody to fill in there and I walked around and a couple of times when there were problems with teachers and, you know, I would be there with the principals, thank God, like Julie and Kathy and all of that and I would say to them afterward, I said, does this person even like kids or even like teaching, huh? Because the, the classroom seems to be abusive, huh? And it might be just perpetuating. The kids might be getting the same message at home that they're going to hear in school, too, huh? And then also household dysfunction. You know, a parent or a sibling living with active addiction, uh, divorce, domestic discord or violence, mental illness, somebody in the family who is chronically ill physically, you know, having a parent who's just unable to work and lives with chronic illness, that that's, that's, can be traumatic for little people. And you know, it's sort of spelled out a little bit more clearly here than that graphic with the color, huh? That 
these are some of the things that can be adverse childhood experiences which we say become traumatic. So addiction then becomes a response to unhealthy rules that we experience in that family or are taught, you know, either verbally or just unspoken rules and the roles we play. So in a dysfunctional family, this is family theory 101, huh? We develop a role just to sort of get by. And again, this is not an indictment when you see who you were on this list because all of us played a role. Huh? Sometimes those roles might have switched if an older brother or sister moved out of the house. Or we might have played two of the roles or sometimes three of the roles. So we can become the responsible child who's gonna make everything better. Even take care of mommy and daddy. You know, Wayne spoke of it or Scott spoke of it as parentifying that at you know, six years old, I'm taking care of my younger brothers or sisters because my mom can't, you know, because she's addicted or because she has to work overnight so I'm left alone with the kids and I have to get them their breakfast. And these stories are not unreal, huh? These stories, they walk down the street not that far and you'll hear these stories. I mean, I was stationed in parishes in Chicopee, in Holyoke. You know, these are very real stories. The adjuster child sort of go along to get along. Uh, the lost child sort of just goes out into his or her whole world, sort of the silent child. You know, lives in that imaginary world, you know, imaginary friends in their room a lot. The acting out child, the only way I know how to deal with this is just to cause more trouble to detract from the other problem. So if my problems are worse, People, especially friends outside the house, won't have to look at what's going on with mom and dad. Then there's rules in these families. We learn rules such as don't feel, don't talk, don't tell, don't cry. If you cry, I'll give you something to cry about. Did you ever hear that? <laughs> and here's sort of a graphic, you know, to put those rules in other names. We, can have a family member who sort of becomes the clown to distract attention, makes everybody laugh. The fixer, the rescuer, sometimes the older person. The people pleaser, sort of the fawn. The non-feeler, the silent child. The socially conscious person, God help it if the neighbors find out about this. You know, I'm gonna paint my family's picture as the perfect family. Then there's the addict, the alcoholic the person living with mental illness, and people adapt these roles just to tiptoe around the problem that we don't feel comfortable talking about, let alone finding therapy for or help for, huh? Because of the dimensions of shame, embarrassment, that are there as really, really little kids, so. We speak about the adult children of alcoholic movements began in New York in 1970s. Um, there are about 30 million adults born to alcoholic parents. This is not even speaking about people addicted to other drugs. And this term, adult child of alcoholic, back in 1970, uh, was established, and I'm grateful to Scott that part of iCatholic, you know, uh, is Catholic in recovery, is be able to address these family dynamics too. So trauma or ACEs are sort of like brother and sisters. And these statistics change depending on who is doing the reporting, but pretty close to average to be able to say that if we are living with adult childhood experience, trauma experiences, that we are three or four times more at risk to develop a substance use disorder. And 30% of those who do live with a substance use disorder meet that criteria for having lived with an adverse childhood experience. And the existence of trauma and ACE history also heightens the likelihood of substance use disorder relapse uh, once we do get sober or clean, huh? That these issues take a lot of therapy and a lot of healing, huh? And the body has this wonderful thing called somatic memory, huh? We remember little things that happen, huh? In our life or not so little things that happen in our life. And their cellular memory, and these memories, we'll look a little bit about when we talk about the brain, they, they can be triggered in adulthood, huh? All of a sudden, you know, I remember this, huh? 
You know, I had a flashback the other day. I was down at my own. I have to get a cataract removed, and believe it or not, they make you go through a full physical just for 15 minutes with a local anesthetic. But we were talking about it. He said, he said your blood pressure went up from the time you were sitting in the chair to the time you got on the table. And I said, where does that come from? And it flashed back to me. And I still remember it, not often, I haven't thought about it in five years, but when I was about four or five, I had my tonsils and adenoid removed. And I can still remember the nun dressed in the full white habit on the porch of the Old Mercy Hospital, suctioning me and, and crying, huh? As a kid, and she just seen, I mean, she was the nicest lady in the world. I met her afterward. She taught nursing at Stick, Mary Elizabeth. And, but I remember that, huh? Just as a little kid with this big white woman white habited woman leaning over me, you know. And so probably the association is right there. That explains it, huh? And it's sort of nice now to be able to look back and say, that's the connection, huh? I know where it comes from. And that's called sober thinking or recovered thinking, huh? I can make the connections so I don't have to run from them, huh? And I can talk about them. I can talk about them. So it heightens relapse, and we speak of these things, trauma or adult childhood experiences and the mental health disorders that result from them, depression, anxiety, or even more profound ones, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, as co-occurring disorders. So this is sort of addictive logic. When I first saw this, I stole this from somebody, obviously. When I first saw this slide, I said, that explains my drinking. These are the messages we give ourselves, and if you're not addicted, you probably can't understand it, but bear with us, okay? Those of us who are. I'm not okay the way I am. There's a void in me that needs to be filled. I might even not know what the void is or what's wrong. There's someone or something external to me that will fill the void. My happiness is dependent upon finding the substance, possession, or person, or role that will fill the void. If only I could do this, or if only I could have this friend or have this job, I'd be okay. And eventually I begin to develop a pathological relationship with a substance or process that fills the void and begins to make me quote unquote feel better. Huh? Most of addiction, certainly chemical addiction, alcohol, other drugs, really it's just we're practicing our own pharmacology, you know. We know we don't feel well, so we find the substance that make us feel well. And that's a pretty human instinct, I think, huh? If I hurt, I don't want to hurt. If my finger's burned on the stove, I we don't want to run it under cold water, even if I'm not supposed to, to make it feel better. That's normal, huh? So I just can't sit still in my own skin. Or these intrusive memories of my past keep coming back, so what can take that away? What can, you know, so people can become addicted to running or jogging. God knows I'm not guilty of it, huh? But that has the same effect in neurotransmission, huh? So much so that if you are in a treatment center, as I was for three months, you know, they'll tell the people so inclined, you can't exercise every day. Because this is just having an impact on that neurochemistry, you know, twice a week. And they never told me that. Uh, okay, so we just can't do it. So we look for that process, that person, that substance that will take away the pain. Perfectly understandable. And just a couple of um, sort of reminders from Brene Brown that sort of speaks about the ability to look at our past honestly. And, you know, Viktor Frankl, the great Austrian born a psychiatrist, a survivor of the Holocaust. An abnormal reaction such as drinking or drugging or hoarding or internet pornography, a reaction to an abnormal situation like childhood trauma is normal behavior. Huh? It becomes unhealthy and hurtful, but we can understand a little bit more and have compassion as to why the addiction might have developed. And also people living with trauma, adult childhood experiences, experience what we call cognitive distortions. And think of people in your life, you know, we heard powerfully the story uh, from the son, Dave's son, you know, he lived with it firsthand, but think of people you know who might be active in addiction, or if you yourself, you know, are in recovery from addiction, 
or think you might need to be in recovery, we sort of develop as a result of the changes in neurochemistry, these cognitive distortions. It's all or nothing thinking. You know, everything is black or white. You know, people active in addiction tend to sort of, you know, there's generalization of everything. Everyone must hate me. You know, all colleges must be bad because I didn't do well in this college, huh? Uh, selectively attending to the negative. They love bad news, huh? I'll never be able to do this. Catastrophizing, you know? A little molehill becomes a mountain, you know? This was just absolutely terrible, the worst thing in my life, and you sort of have to try to help them in therapy to sort of right-size the thing. You know, this is the way you perceive it, but let's try to right-size it. Discounting the positives. They, they can't see the good things in themselves or in the world around them. Personalization. They take everything personally, huh? You're doing this because you don't like me, huh? You know, you're not like this with other people. You're picking on me. And then negative assumptions. You know, nothing good will come from this. This, this disease, if they're even aware of it, it is hopeless. So these are just uh, some of the statistics taken from the Beacon Group again, that the chance of a person developing uh, addiction who has lived with an adverse childhood experiences, it increases, you know, exponentially by the number of adverse childhood experiences they have had. And again, you can go to the Beacon Group to see more about this. And we have physicians in the room here and nurses in the room, so I'm not going to presume to, you know, give, you know, a lecture that you'd hear in medical school or nursing school on the brain, but just go back to biology, sophomore year of high school. Sister Elizabeth James was my teacher, and we looked at this stuff there, huh? Just the different areas of the brain that are involved in addiction and how this works and the transmission of, of these neurotransmitters and this frontal cortex, you know, Scott's is impaired, mine's impaired worse, huh? Uh, that, you know, we come to a point where we begin, something appears to us right away and we begin to make a lot of generalizations as a result of the trauma, huh? Signaling that, you know, this is danger or this brings back a memory of this or that, that there's all sorts of things taken and also, you might have heard of the HPA access, sometimes the endocrine system and cortisol, that you know, the more we're exposed to traumatic situations, the cortisol level increases, sends a message to the brain, and eventually we, we need more and more of that cortisol just to be able to feel stabilized, huh? that you know, this hormone serves as a type of neurotransmitter and sends a message to the brain by releasing cortisol, it's okay, but eventually it doesn't work, huh? So I had to switch, I had to drink more to get the same effect, I have to use more to get the same effect because it's no longer working. And again, the, the whole circuitry is off, so there's this dimension to it. So if we look at what happens when there's you know, trauma exposure, you know, we perceive with that frontal cortex and in that amygdala, that part of the brain that's always waiting for the next shoe to drop. We're flooded with psychologically painful memories. We feel psychological pain, depressed, anxious, suicidal. We use substances, something's wrong with me, or a process. You know, if I go to the casino, these feelings will go away. If you do PET scans of the brain, you can look at people who are addicted to gambling or alcohol. The same parts of the brain are activated upon just, you know, a momentary exposure in a PET scan to an image of like somebody drinking. You can see the brain light up, huh? The same thing if you show some gambling apparatus like dice. You look at the, you know, the, what's happening in the brain chemistry of somebody who's addicted to gambling. Those things will begin to light up again, huh? That gets better the longer you're sober. But it's the same effect, huh? Then we come to a point where we have attempts at recovery. You know, we begin to move, Melinda spoke about that stage of pre-contemplation. We begin to make that connection. Something's wrong with me, I don't feel right, and what's wrong with me might be connected to the way I drink or gamble. There's that moment of clarity that Scott spoke about. That moment of clarity took place for me in 1999 in the steps of Sacred Heart Church. I was coming in late from partying with friends, and God bless him, George Farland, the priest, was coming out for a sick call. 
like about midnight and he looked at me and he said, Mark, do you want to die? You know, do you want to die? Because that's where that, it would lead me, huh? And then, you know, thank God I was in treatment the next week, huh? That's the moment of clarity. Uh, this initial awareness that something was wrong with me. And then the thing we have to say here that when we look at addiction through a trauma informs lens, we see that the addiction became often a key to survival, an unhealthy one ultimately, that very often current treatment modalities and the stigma attached have not helped the person, initial attempts at recovery deal with it. And again, the shaming techniques that are there. If you're an addict or somebody who lives with a mental health disorder, there's still a lot of stigma attached to it. So just to go back to this, um, you can see these in the slides that you'll be given. This is just some non-stigmatizing language that we can be more sensitive to, huh? You know, to speak of people as a person struggling with a substance use disorder rather than a substance or drug abuser, or calling them an alcoholic or an addict. These are very, very pejorative, huh? And you just skip right down that list and just see how much more helpful the terms on the left are than those on the right. So what I started to say, as soon as we have those attempts at sobriety, and as we begin to clear up, uh, as we begin to see things for what they are, as the brain chem chemistry begins to regulate itself, it's very common for those memories that we've repressed to begin to come back. It's just normal, huh? We've deadened them through active using. And you're newly recovered, you're newly sober and still struggling because naturally, and we usually say that for the changes in brain